Today, individuals who wish to learn about unconventional or unpopular theories face an enormous obstacle. Before determining the theory's validity, one must first gain an accurate understanding of what the theory actually proposes. For individuals seeking to learn about the electric universe, this task is remarkably difficult due to rampant misrepresentations of the theory, both by uninformed or sensational would-be proponents and critics of the theory alike. A surprisingly prevalent tactic against the electric universe is the characterization of its proponents as, quote, conspiracy theorists. Let us lay aside for the moment the question of the prevalence of actual, quote, conspiracies, both throughout history and in the world today. Let us explore instead, why is this accusation made specifically against proponents of the electric universe? I want to talk today about why it is that people who believe that there is some problem with scientific theory are frequently labeled online as conspiracy theorists. What this talk is not about are people who actually talk about conspiracies. I'm specifically referring to the situation where one person is talking about science and the other person is calling that first a conspiracy theorist. This happens enough online that it demands some sort of an explanation. I would argue that this practice is enormously destructive to society's ability to talk about lesser known innovative ideas in science. If every time that people want to talk about an idea in science which diverges from the textbook theory, there is this societal reaction to isolate and label that activity as something it is not even intended to be, I think there needs to be a very strong reaction to this subtly destructive behavior. Michael, as you very well know, plasma cosmology is a topic that has been published in IEEE's Transactions on Plasma Science for many years now. In a sense, it is classical science insofar as the theorists have traditionally sought out inferences for astronomical observations which pertain to classical physics principles, electricity, magnetism, plasmas, double layers, and so on. And the methodology itself is really quite scientific insofar as observations within plasma laboratories like Tokamaks of filamentary electrical structures have inspired theorists to suggest that cosmic plasma behaves in similar ways. It's a perfect example, really, of what is meant by empirical science. So why is it that when people refer to the electric universe or more, more appropriately plasma cosmology online, these people are commonly labeled as conspiracy theorists? The fact of the matter is that there isn't a trace of conspiracy within the Thunderbolts group's publications. These theorists are talking about plasma science, astrophysics, and cosmology, and their thesis is that academic institutions should be modeling the cosmic plasma to better match our observations of laboratory plasmas. There should be no confusion that there are mistakes in the textbooks right now, and history is just littered with spectacular examples of mistaken expertise. And Michael, they all have something important in common. Try to see if you can pick up on what I'm referring to as I run through four significant examples. Number one, when radio waves were first observed coming from space by radio engineers, the astronomical community assumed it was either a mistake or a hoax. Second, when the MASER, the laser's microwave precursor, was invented, the world's most prestigious quantum theorists claimed that the prototype, which was already created, was impossible due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Third, it wasn't that long ago that the scientific community regarded meteorites in the same way that modern scientists regard UFO abductions and psychic phenomena, quaint superstitions only believed by peasant folk. And fourth, rocket-powered spacecrafts were ridiculed virtually all the way up until 1944 when they started raining down on London during World War II. The common aspect that people tend to miss with these stories is not the simple fact that the entire scientific community was wrong. I think the most people generally understand that this has happened. The key aspect to realize is that the scientific community does not today strive to teach these stories as lessons which students of science and the public can learn from on the nature of scientific consensus. And so there evolves a predictable public perception that these kinds of fundamental mistakes are rare in our modern times. I want to quote Bill Beatty. He says, intellectual suppression has a long history involving eccentric but revolutionary science. Throughout the history of science, famous researchers who eventually created entire new fields of science initially found it nearly impossible to publish their research. 
Some didn't succeed for years, even decades. The scientific community ignored them, but eventually they were heard. Eventually they conquered the suppression, but only after a major fight. The journal editors rejected their papers because the new research results were in conflict with common knowledge. It was too eccentric. Yet the eccentric ideas were right, and common knowledge was not. Skipping ahead, note well that nobody conspired to silence these revolutionary researchers. Editors and fellow scientists simply assumed that the eccentric papers were misguided. So that is the vital context for the question that I want to pose. If we don't need conspiracies to explain why experts and textbooks have, even in modern times, been wrong, then why do people commonly conflate those who disagree with textbook scientific theory with conspiracy theorists? Here is my unexpected answer to this tricky question. The story more or less starts with Edward Bernays, the relative of Sigmund Freud who showed American corporations for the first time how they could make people want things they didn't need by linking mass-produced goods to their unconscious desires. Quoting Pat Jackson, Bernays' colleague and public relations advisor, what Eddie got from Freud was indeed this idea that there is a lot more going on in human decision making, not only among individuals, but even more importantly among groups than this idea that information drives behavior. So Eddie began to formulate this idea that you had to look at things that will play to people's irrational emotions. So where am I going with this? The point is that here in the United States, we are already accustomed and actively encouraged to behave irrationally all the time. It's just an aspect of how businesses sell things. So given this history, which clearly has nothing at all to do with a conspiracy, here's what people need to ask themselves. Does this subconscious aspect of the mind simply shut up when the subject switches to science? Or alternatively, can we think of this ideal of thinking like a scientist, in part, as a process of keeping these natural subconscious tendencies in check? Fast forward more than half a century to 2002, when Daniel Kahneman was awarded the Nobel for taking Bernays' ideas to the next level. For many years, the practice of marketing, whether for a product or an idea, was considered a sort of fluffy black magic by CEOs and others because it lacked an actual model for what, what was happening in the mind in regards to human decision making. That all changed with Kahneman's contributions to decision science, whose work has come to affect all of the social sciences. My own suggestion will, will be to propose that Kahneman's work can naturally explain this conspiracy theorist labeling. And the implications are enormous, if I'm right, for the way we talk about science online, because it ultimately points the way to how we might design future uh, social networks that aim to make online discourse more scientific. Kahneman's claim is that when a person encounters complexity, they will either consciously or implicitly realize they lack both the time and inclination to research this claim. If he's right, then that realization arrives as a feeling, which makes it faster than any rational thought and therefore our initial reaction. That feeling then primes whatever rational thought that follows. The subconscious is a natural reaction to everything that happens to us based upon the patterns we've formerly experienced. The key is to realize that you don't intentionally think it, it happens to you. This process, more formally known as associative coherence, appears to the rational thinker as believable narratives. As probably most adults would acknowledge, these seemingly fully formed ideas just pop into our heads. The thing about associative coherence that is not widely understood by the public is that it benefits from a lack of detail. As details are added in, what happens more often than not is that the believable narrative turns out to be wrong. So what I see a lot of online is that people have formed a system of beliefs about science which they subconsciously use as a filter to limit the effort of rational thought. And this is a natural response to information overload. These largely subconscious decisions to refuse to learn about something can create significant ignorance of that particular thing. And this can happen even if the person is extraordinarily intelligent in other aspects or activities. Much of the news media, by the way, actively encourages and reinforces this filtering behavior. So here's the important bit. 
This empty cognitive space becomes a playground for associative coherence. People who have not actively sought to teach themselves about certain things in science must fall back onto these far simpler pattern-based processes for evaluating claims about those things. My own personal observations online confirm for me that Kahneman is right, that this behavior is extremely common, even amongst academic researchers. So what I'm saying is that when a person does not actively seek to develop a nuanced, nuanced understanding of academic research, things like how it works, the limits of scientific methodology and domains, critiques by whistleblowers, critiques of peer review and historical examples of failed expertise. The people who refuse to actively learn about these things are more prone to simplistic associations of those who disagree with textbook theory to conspiracy theorists. I see it all the time. People who label others that are actually talking about science as conspiracy theorists will completely ignore the scientific arguments being made and project their own lack of understanding upon the very person that is trying to educate them about some innovative scientific idea. As Kahneman's model continues to disseminate throughout our culture, I believe that it is just inevitable that we will build communication systems which help people to see their own tendencies towards associative coherence by exposing it in the others they are talking to. We cannot see it in ourselves, but we can see it in others, and in that indirect way, we can make online scientific conversations more scientific.